your royal highness, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I've been waiting 10 years to say your royal highness. <laughs> it's wonderful to be able to do that. Thank you so much for coming out to what's going to be a phenomenal program this afternoon. Um, my job is to welcome you and also to introduce the moderator for this event, uh, which I will do, Dr. Peter Barta, born in Budapest, Hungary, shortly I left in 1956. He's been associated with Texas Tech University since 1986, when he started as an assistant professor in Russian and German. Uh, Dr. Bart has also been associated with the University of Surrey since 1999, and he was offered a chair in comparative literature in 2000. But we are delighted to have him back at Texas Tech. He is definitely helping us globalize our curriculum, and His Royal Highness is here largely due to the connection that Peter has had with him. So thank you very much, Dr. Barta for allowing this wonderful program to take place this evening. Also, uh, I would like to thank some of the other sponsors of this program who helped us get His Royal Highness here. Honors College, thanks very much. College of Arts and Sciences, the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. I know you're here somewhere, Steve. And the CH Foundation. So thanks very much to each and every one. Please give them a round of applause. So without further ado, Dr. Peter Barta, the moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my very great pleasure to um, moderate this uh, event this afternoon and to welcome His Imperial and Royal Highness uh, Georg von Habsburg Lothringen. Um, uh, uh, the Habsburg family was um, intricately involved with the history of Europe, having been on the throne of uh, Austria initially the Holy Roman Empire and from 1867 Austria-Hungary uh, for close to 800 years. <clears throat> After the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918, six years after this event, the last emperor and king, um, His Royal Highness's grandfather, uh, Emperor and King Karl, died prematurely as a young man. His um, eldest son and heir to the throne, in fact, the last crown prince of Austria-Hungary, Otto von Habsburg-Lothringen, was then uh, basically a child. He had an extraordinarily difficult life, um, largely uh, penniless to start out with, and he emerged after the Second World War part of which he spent in the United States fleeing from uh, being uh, persecuted by Nazi Germany. He became one of the most significant figures behind the emergence of institutions that ultimately led to the European Community and the European Union. Uh, Otto von Habsburg established and presided over the pan-European movement. In addition to that, he spent uh, decades in the European Parliament, where during the years of communism, he uh, was an advocate of many of the countries in the Eastern Bloc, which used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His children, um, were very close to him in many of his endeavors. The one event I would like briefly to talk to you about was the pan-European picnic, which took place in 1989. And His Royal Highness, together with his uh, sister, um, Archduchess um, Gabriele von Habsburg-Rothringen, were 
present at this very important event with their father, essentially the Iron Curtain, this horrendous barbed wire fence between Hungary and Austria, was opened for an afternoon. And this essentially marked the end of this dreadful period of the division of Europe. Uh, Otto von Habsburg's children are remarkable. Rather than being uh, pampered and spoiled rich children of a royal family, they, uh, each of them became highly distinguished um, professionals. Um, the heir to the throne, um, who inherited the post of the head of family at the time of the death of um, Crown Prince Otto, um, Archduke Karl, was a member of the European Parliament for 20 years for uh, Bavaria, and then he has served as a member of the same parliament as an Austrian Euro MP. In addition, he is a colonel of the Austrian Air Force and is involved with a large number of very important human rights related issues and organizations. I would just mention two of His Royal Highness's sisters, uh, Archduchess uh, Gabriele, who is a sculptor. In fact, her sculpture stands at the place of the pan-European picnic in, on the border of Austria and Hungary, and it's a remarkable piece of art. She also uh, ended up in Georgia, where she became a citizen of that country, and has served for a number of years, I think over a decade, as Georgia's ambassador to Berlin. Another sister of His Royal Highness, uh, Archduchess uh, Walburga, is married to a, uh, an aristocrat in Sweden, and she has become a member of the Swedish parliament. His Royal Highness himself was born in 1964 in Peking on the Starnberger See in, ba in Bavaria, and he moved to Hungary in 1992. He, following closely in his father's footsteps, was involved with the pan-European movement and emerged in Hungary as a very important public figure. He's been consultant for governmental affairs of the uh, Hungarian president. He's been, since 19, the mid-90s, a roving ambassador of the Hungarian prime minister. He was the president of the Hungarian Red Cross from 2004 and to 2012, and he serves at present as an advisor of the International Federation of the Red Cross. He is a specialist within the Red Cross on integrity issues. He is regularly consulted on matters of politics and also on matters of international business. It's um, um, going to be a treat to us, ladies and gentlemen, to hear his views about the future of Europe. He's got a phenomenal knowledge of European history, and he's also a very good public speaker. So without further ado, I would like to invite His Imperial and Royal Highness to give his address following his presentation, which we believe will be 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to come back and I'm going to try to lead and moderate a discussion where you'll be asked to comment and ask questions. So, uh, His Royal Highness. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you that it's an enormous pleasure for me to be in Western Texas. And uh, after listening to what Professor Barthes said before, I, he has set the level very high for my speech, and I must say it 
must be also kind of an interesting treat for the audience to have three Hungarian speakers, one after the other, to explain you European future and European history. And the other thing is that it is also a rather difficult task for me to have about 15 to 20 minutes to, to talk about the future of Europe, which is a rather complicated issue and therefore I probably will be a little bit longer than 15 minutes, but I try really to keep more time that we can discuss things and argue about it. First of all, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's for me the first time to come to Texas. And uh, looking a little bit in the history, I've seen that Texas was under Habsburg rule from 1521 to 1700, so I feel a little bit like coming home, looking a little bit for the Habsburg history here in Texas, but uh, also only having arrived 25 hours ago, I think I have to go a little bit more intensive studies about this connection between the Habsburg family and Texas. Well, if we want to talk about the future of Europe, we, I think it's very difficult to do this without, first of all, looking into the past and seeing what has influenced the European Union for, let's say, the situation it is in for the moment to find out what is going to happen. Because my father always used to say, who does not know where he comes from cannot know where he goes to because he does not know where he is. And therefore it is very important to think a little bit more about history and understand history. And I think, unfortunately, it is not yet 2014, because if it would be next year, I would have a much easier task, because we are celebrating three very important events next year. First of all, it will be 200 years of the Treaty of Vienna. So the Vienna Congress that was made to, to, to um, organize peace after the Napoleonic Wars. It will be 100 years for the beginning of the First World War. So 100 years ago, the First World War started. And it will be 25 years of the fall of the Iron Curtain. So there will be very many events that will be kept to remember these three important points, which really influenced Europe very strongly. Starting a little bit very briefly with the Congress of Vienna, which was kind of a very interesting event starting 1813 with, after the Napoleonic Wars, all the winning powers decided under the leadership of Chancellor Metternich to come together in Vienna and to decide about the future of Europe. And they did something very spectacular, which unfortunately people afterwards tended to forget. Because after winning a war, it is very good if the winning powers sit together and decide. But it's very unusual that at the same time they were inviting the losers of this war, of this Napoleonic war, the French, to participate in this Congress and also to be at the same level as the winning powers. So to take everybody together to sit down and discuss how the future should look like. And by this there were no losers or winners, they were all at the same level sitting together to decide about the future of Europe. And it was also, let's say, it, it was not directly a congress where people were all sitting together in a big room, it was more, you know, bilateral discussions between some politicians and at the same time they were organized some big parties and social events to everybody feel more comfortable and happy, which was helping also to a successful outcome of the Congress of Vienna. But what came out was a period of 50 years of peace for the European continent. And this is something what well, unfortunately at the later stage, but I'm going to talk about this also a little bit later, after the First war, World War, that was the big mistake, that the winning powers were deciding to dictate the peace over the losing powers of this war. And this was creating a lot of trouble. But let's come to the First World War and what were, let's say, the big problems that were starting with this First World War. If you take the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you will see that this was kind of an assembly of a lot of different nations, cultures, languages, traditions, religions, that were all living together under a single roof. If you just see how many countries of today's European Union were either entirely parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, like Austria, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Slovenia, now Croatia, Bosnia, 
or parts of Romania, Ukraine, Italy. They were all forming part of this Austro-Hungarian Empire. And therefore it was very important to have a structure that all these different ideas, nations, could live together without having a conflict. And that was the basic idea that you can see also historically of the Habsburg family, to have the so-called Reichsidee. This is a very complicated German word because if you talk about Reichsidee, people immediately think about the Second World War, Adolf Hitler or something, what he said about the, the, the Reich. If you translate it into English and you talk about the imperial idea, you see a Maharaja drinking tea in India and it's also not what it is all about. In French, l'idée imperiale, it sounds very Napoleonic. What it means is that the Habsburgs wanted to have a supranational rule of law on the basis of subsidiarity. That means that you had all these nations living together in this empire, but having above them a rule of law where in the case of the conflict they could refer to and could have some help that conflicts shouldn't be solved bilaterally, but could be solved with the help of a bigger power, which was, of course, mostly, uh, let's say, guaranteed by the position of the emperor and of the king and of his administration. And it even got, in 1906, it entered into a legal framework, which was a very remarkable thing, the Moravian Agreement. Moravia, there was a conflict between the German and the Slavic-speaking population. And so a law was, they, they had, a, conflict between these both nationalities because each one was thinking that the other one was taking control over them. And there was a law developed that said that, for example, that regulated the language used in the schools. There was a law that regulated how the parliament should run, how many representatives of which parliament, uh, of, which nationali of which nationality would be in this parliament, so that both groups found their representation in the public affairs and by this solved the problem between these two nations side by side. So it was very important to have a supranational rule of law on subsidiarity. What is subsidiarity? Subsidiarity is that the bigger entity is not allowed to fulfill tasks that the smaller entity is able to fulfill. So this is very important so that the smaller entity also knows that its interests are well protected. So this was happening quite well in Austria-Hungary, and it was working very positively. But with the First World War, and with, unfortunately, the horrible results the First World War was bringing, and the destruction of big empires that were working up to that moment, unfortunately, hell broke loose with nationalism, national socialism, coming of the Second World War, and also the rise of communism. But there was already in 1923 a movement, or let's better say a gentleman called Richard Kudnov Kalergi, who started the so-called pan-European movement. This was the first European unification movement. He was a very interesting personality because um, his father was a diplomat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was basically from Bohemia. His mother was Japanese, so that was also a very interesting cultural influence on him. And he was saying, he was seeing what, let's say, broke together in um, uh, when the First World War was over. He was foreseeing what happened if nationalists would take over and nationalist movie, uh, movements would enter uh, into Europe and would create so many trouble that the next war would be inevitable. And so he started this pan-European movement, but unfortunately he didn't have the possibility to really raise enough interest that the politicians were convinced that you had to unite Europe. And so it was only after the Second World War that people remembered what were these ideas of uh, well, having in mind the horrors the Second World War was presenting to them, that they were really coming back to these ideas and they said we have to think about what to do that we're not going to go into another world war or into another bigger crisis. And um, they started to come back to the ideas of this pan-European movement and to think about how to build this unity of Europe. 
Um, of course, it was very complicated, you know, the, you know, the communist countries, and it could only be stopped on the on the ruins of the of the Second World War. So it was first, you know, the the Union for Coal and Steel that was built, but it needed some very famous politicians really to make this European Union start working. And there was in France the General Charles de Gaulle, and in Germany the Chancellor uh, Adenauer, who were really taking the initiative of taking up the ideas to work on the unification of Europe. And what they did was something, a very first and very important step. It was, it was not this, what we all read in the books, this economical coal and steel union and, and starting to work together economically, which is something very important. But knowing that practically, historically, all the conflicts were between France and Germany. And for everybody who was, after the, the Second World War, living there, it was clear that if there would be once again a war, it would be, you know, France on one side, Germany on the other side. They decided to work in schools, to take school children from France, bring them to Germany, into German schools, take German school children, take them to France and make them learn there. And also when I still went to school in the 70s, it was absolutely clear that from my school every year a class was going to France and the French class was coming to our school. So everybody had friends in France, and so somehow these two countries were growing together and were giving by this a very good example of what you can reach if suddenly you start, let's say, working on knowing each other better, building up economical relationships, um, building up kind of a joint market, and by this step by step more and more countries were joining to build this European Union. And of course, a major, two major milestones were when in 1979, the first European Parliament was elected. Because by this, Europe got a structure and a Parliament that could really take decisions that would be important for the whole of Europe. They had democratically freely elected members of parliament who were representing all the countries that were members of this European community and ongoing into the European Union. And of course, the next very important step was when in 1989, the Iron Curtain broke down, the Warsaw Pact disappeared, and the Central European countries were able to join this very important union. And also, once again, for me, when I went to school in Germany, by the time the Iron Curtain was still there, it was for me absolutely clear that if there would be once a war, it would be a war with NATO on one side, the Warsaw Pact on the other side. So there would be very big possibility to have a war between Hungary and Austria, or Czechoslovakia and, and, and Germany, because that, were, that, that, that was really a fact that there would be a danger of having a war there. But thanks to the European Union, thanks to the breaking together, but to the collapsing of the communist system, Central Europe once again becoming free and having only one intention to come as fast as possible, joining this European Union, seeing all the advantages that are in this union, um, this, this danger of war disappeared. And this is something really fantastic to see because today, you know, when I, when I read in the newspapers about the European Union, we read about economical crisis, difficulties, where is the euro going, what is going to happen? And people tend to forget about this political dimension of the European Union and what this European Union was bringing to a continent who for centuries was standing in wars, one with each other, and where there was practically uh, one conflict after the other in this European Union. So politically, it was working very well because it was growing together. The European countries are growing together. And so we have to see something. When we talk today about the crisis in the European Union, it is happening on different layers. Yes, in the European Union is a banking crisis. But unfortunately, the banking crisis you also had here. And um, well, everybody was working very hard to, to solve this banking crisis. When we have the banking crisis in Europe, we needed the economical policy to somehow solve the banking crisis, which was very difficult and therefore also economically there are big dangers in the European Union, still very unsolved, many unsolved problems in countries like Spain, like Portugal, like Greece. But on the other hand, which is not touched by that, is the political idea of the European Union, is the working together of the European countries in the institutions 
being at the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the European Council. And this is what really is producing the peace and stability on a continent that historically didn't have this peace and stability. And this is something where nobody is arguing in Europe or from the European politicians that we need the European Union for the peace and stability of this continent. Because everybody knows that one day of war can destruct more, can, can destroy more than you can build in many, many years of peace. So peace and stability is something very important. And now, let me tell you a little bit out of our Hungarian perspective. When Hungary in 89 finally could get rid of communism, and everybody in Hungary and all the politicians wanted to join the European Union. It was in the beginning, foremost the importance was the security and not economically getting stronger, but to have security because everybody knew that being a part of NATO is the first step, very important. But being part of European Union means security for the country. And security is stability, and stability is the most important thing what you need to build up your country and to build up your economy in difficult times. So, as you somehow hear in my words, I'm rather optimistic about the future of the European Union. And I think there's absolutely no danger in the field of let's say, the political will in Europe that this European Union is growing. And I think the European Union is also strong enough to overcome the economical difficulties they are facing. We have now also, after the elections in Germany from last Sunday, seen that there won't be any kind of big changes in German politics and uh, Germany is going to remain a very uh, solid role um, in this European Union and also finding out that the party that everybody was afraid of in Germany, the anti-European party, didn't get enough votes to come um, into the parliament, which is also a good sign for Europe that people believe in the Euro-friendly policy of the German government. But where are the problems? And unfortunately, of course, there are also problems. <clears throat> a big problem is laying, lying in the communication. Because people, when something works very positive, people tend to forget about it, and people to take, forget, forget a little bit to, to, to let's say, to, to, to get more intensively away. Because if something goes well, and the political collaboration in Europe is something very positive, you don't write about it. You prefer to write much more about crisis and everything that goes wrong. So we need, in Europe, to understand much more what is the importance of this political idea of the European Union. That really it was the European Union that was giving um, peace and stability to this continent. And I am getting especially aware of this question because I have a lot of lectures in schools, not only in Hungary, but also in other countries where I discuss with, uh, with, with the children in school. And then when I start talking about communism and Iron Curtain and difficulties that were, let's, that were separating Europe and that were creating big trouble, I see that this has already, you know, this has, is a fact that has moved beside the pyramids in Egypt and the Roman empires and Limes and, and, and this is, you know, this is the past that is, that is no longer existing for us and this is no longer uh, creating any problem. This is something people tend to forget very quickly, how complicated the situation was only 30 years ago in Europe and even more to forget the horrors of the Second World War and what it means not to have security and to uh, see the realities of the wars. You have to be strong. You have to see the dangers the European continent went through. And therefore, it is very important always to talk about what has been reached, what were the uh, successes of the European Union, and um, how important the benefits are this European Union was given to you. The other thing is, European Union has also always thinking about enlargement. By the moment you say the European Union is closed down and we only have to work how to improve this existing European Union, it's a big mistake. 
European Union is something that is developing and that has developed all the time and this was giving kind of always a uh, reason to work on and to, 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 to see how, which country can join the European Union and uh, who, who can be helped to become better developed. For example, it is very important to go on negotiating with Turkey. Turkey should, at a certain point, join the European Union. In the European Union today, there's a very important project which is called the Eastern Partnership. The Eastern Partnership is working uh, closer with Ukraine, with Belarusia, with Armenia, with Azerbaijan, with Georgia, and to see how they can be brought closer to the European Union to keep this development going in Europe. Let's say, let's say, much even much closer than these countries to see what is happening with Bosnia, with Serbia, with Albania. You know, a part of Europe that has also historically always been a very complicated part. The Balkans always had some, 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 some very big difficulties. To work on this project to bring them closer and into the European Union as fast as possible is also something to keep the European Union going. And I think this is something where you also see the will by the European politicians to do that, especially now after accepting Croatia, which was a very important step. I hope very much that also they are going to work very strongly to bring these countries in, but also to look further and to see which can be the countries that, um, that should join the European Union in the future. We really, oh Lord, I'm already over half an hour. Um, we should really also, with this, I'm going to finish. What I'm talking about is um, the enlargement also of the European Union is something which is going to look for the next 5, 10, 20 years. But I think it's a big mistake not to look a little bit further in the future. The European Union is a group of countries that share the same values. And this is something which is very important. And so if a country that is neighboring the European Union is willing to accept and to share the values that the European Union is representing, they also should have the possibility to join this European Union. And therefore, if you look at the map, and I love looking at maps, if you see Europe and you see the Mediterranean, and you go back in history and look what was the role of the Mediterranean in history, it was never a border, it was always a center of something, also historically. And therefore, I really, probably it sounds very strange if I'm talking about, but if we look forward 50 years, 100 years, I can imagine that the countries bordering the Mediterranean are going at a certain stage, joining a structure that is, let's say, an enlarged European Union. So I see there a lot of potential, an incredible possibility for this continent, and I hope very much that we are going to find also in the future convinced Europeans to take forward this incredible important project. And I hope that they won't lose their optimism by easy re reading the newspapers and getting all the pessimistic information, because only if you're an optimist you can bring things forward. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, thank you very much indeed for um, this excellent presentation. And um, let me start the discussion by plagiarizing from Her Majesty the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who in one of her Christmas broadcasts asked the question, do you know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? The optimist thinks that he or she lives in the best of all possible worlds and the pessimist fears that this could be true. <laughs> His Royal Highness is an optimist, and um, I would like to invite you to uh, ask questions. We do not have unlimited time. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador Noik has told me that at most we have until 6.45. So I would like to ask you to ask specific questions and keep the questions short so that we should be able to give an opportunity to as many of you to ask questions as possible. The floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm from the UK. I wondered what do you think the role of the European Union could be in Serbia? Regarding Bosnia and Srebrenica, those are the Kosovo issue. Um, because Serbia is very close to Russia, but then in Kosovo and um, the Bosnia, part of Bosnia is very close to Europe. 
and how do you suppose the European Union could bridge this gap? Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, this is a very burning spot inside of, let's say, at, not inside, but very close to the European Union. And therefore, it is so incredibly important that the European Union intensifies its negotiations with Serbia to bring Serbia and also Bosnia as fast as possible into the European Union. I can only, you know, talk from the experience we have had in Hungary by the moment the European Union had a joint border with Hungary by Austria joining the European Union because we immediately felt the positive effect what it means to have a border with a European Union country let's say attracting investment people coming there the infrastructure got better in first of all in Western Hungary and I see very much what this means if now the European Union is growing, it's got a border with Serbia. Now also a lot of developments are moving into Serbia and now with Croatia joining the European Union, also Bosnia has a joint border with the European Union. So this is something which um, we have to work from the side of the European Union and I, I think also Hungary is, has to play a very strong, is playing a very strong role in that. They already played a very strong role to bring Croatia into the European Union, but also to see that this enlargement is going on. Why? There are a lot of minorities living in Serbia and also a big Hungarian minority. So it is the interest for us, but it's also the interest for others to have this minority to join, to, to get for them also the benefits of the European Union and on the long run, of course, that the borders are disappearing between the countries. Because it made such an incredible difference, you know, in the European Union with the so-called Schengen Agreement when the borders were disappearing, when you don't have to go around and show your passport in every day. It was solving so many emotional problems that were existing. And one thing you can say about the Balkans, the Balkans is full about emotional problems. And um, which this, this emotional problems can be best solved when you take out borders, when you give the possibility to work for the people normally together, when you give them economical possibilities, which is boosting their trade and it was boosting our trade when we were joining the European Union. Kosovo. Kosovo is of course a very big problem because it involves the bigger politics and it also has some European Union countries like Romania and like Spain that were very much afraid about what was happening in Kosovo, looking at their own country and seeing what is happening with their, let's say, different regions. They were very much looking for getting more independence and they were very much afraid if they would look closer to, to if they would accept the independence of Kosovo, this would have immediately a reaction. And this is also the reason why the Russians are very much afraid about, uh, let's say, seeing more positive the, the, the independence of Kosovo because they are very afraid about what is happening in their own territory and what example this could give to what the situation is of a lot of, of, of let's say, regions and nations inside of Russia that want to get their independence. But it's a fact, you know. Kosovo is an independent state. It is recognized. It is, it is there. And now also it succeeded that the European Union, and there our representative for foreign policy, Ms. Ashton, she was the person who was bringing together the Serbians, the Kosovars, and the European Union to a table and say, you have to solve this problem. And we are going somehow to solve this problem together. And if Serbia wants to join the European Union, they have first to solve their relation with the Kosovo, and we have to find how to, to, to do a, to, to make this, to find this solution for this for this Kosovo conflict. But you know, this is also not something new in the European Union. We had this conflict in the past between Austria and Italy, with South Tyrol. South Tyrol was a region that was, you know, predominantly speaking German, had not so much to do with Italy, and that was taken away by Italy from Austria. It was huge problems. It was creating enormous troubles. Bombs were thrown, uh, demonstrations were kept in South Tyrol that they wanted to come, come back to Austria. Today, nobody talks about the problem of South Tyrol. It has vanished. You know, the two countries have grown together. There is no longer existing a border. Okay, one guy is reporting to Rome, the others are reporting to Vienna. No problem, but they are neighbors, they're living beside each other, they don't have to show a passport when one goes to the other, they pay with the same currency and the problem has vanished. For Hungary, a huge problem 
is still today, was in the past, after the First World War and the Treaty of Trianon, Hungary was losing two-thirds of its territory. And a huge part of Romania, Transylvania, was, let's say, given to Romania. This was creating enormous troubles, and it was very, very painful for Hungarians to accept that every time that they wanted to travel from Hungary to Hungary, in their opinion, they had to show the passport and to, to go to the Romanian authorities and, and to do that. Now, thanks God, this problem is slowly but surely disappearing because in a very short time Romania is joining the Schengen Agreement, the border is going to disappear. The border is now in a way that you can pass over, they are no longer controlling very much because it's two European Union countries. And by this, this problem is vanishing. And this is also something which I see a solution for the Balkan. If the borders are disappearing, and with the Kosovo it will take many years, I, I, I know, and because the wounds are still too deep, and there was so much bloodshed in this area, and there was so much bloodshed in, in, in Bosnia also, and it will take a very long time to heal. But I see the only way of peacefully finding a remedy to heal the wounds that were happening there is gradually accepting this country. Serbia very fast, with Kosovo it will take a little bit longer, into the European Union and work on the disappearance of border and let's say that this country also feel secure inside of the European Union. And now I come back to the so-called Reichsidee, the supranational rule of law. If the Kosovars and the Serbians have a conflict together, they don't have to solve the conflict between Kosovo and Serbia. They can go to Brussels, they can go to the European Parliament, they can go to the European Court to solve problems. And this is also helping a lot in solving peacefully the conflict. So on the long run, I see a fantastic remedy in the European Union to solve that problem, and I hope that this is also going in this direction. Thank you very much. Um, uh, other questions and comments? Um, yes, please. Sir. Um, I believe it was Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel that made the comment that multiculturalism has failed in Europe, uh, given high immigration from Africa and the Middle East and rising you know, fascist parties such as the Golden Dawn in Greece and Marine Le Pen uh, in France. What do you feel about Europe's future, future in that regard? Thank you very much. I, she, she, she didn't say that generally the immigration policy of the European Union has failed. That there are trouble in the European Union with immigrants and that there are troubles in several European countries with minorities. That's a fact, and unfortunately, that you had to experience in France very, very intensively. You had to, to experience it for a certain level in Germany. Um, this is also something which, which, which has been visible, and that there, um, unfortunately, sometimes governments tend to solve problems by just say, we spend a lot of money to solve this problem, but really don't go to the source of the problem. This is something which unfortunately is happening, uh, happening rather often. That this is creating tensions, let's say, this um, big movements of migrants coming to Europe um, is true. But it is creating the tensions because people are not well prepared for what is happening and the changes that are going, that are going through the societies. If you see in Europe, unfortunately, the amount of people getting older and let's say no children born inside the European Union is a very substantial problem that is going also to have a very big impact on the future in Europe to keep let's say the financial systems working because um, that uh, society is going to develop, let's say in a normal way, uh, average family has to have 2.4 children. I always don't like this 0.4 children because it's very difficult to imagine, but let's say the average 2.4 children that the society remains in level. In the European it's 1.2 children per family. And this is going to create a lot of trouble because this is also something which automatically is going to, to bring much more people coming to the European Union because you need them for working there and for, for, for helping the, the economy to work. And this is something where you have to go through a process in learning this, in giving this, the, on one side immigrants, on the, other side, uh, on the other side the minority, to get a better way to be represented, to have people who take their course forward and who take their course to the European institutions to see how they can be better protected. And it comes back to another thing which is, in my opinion, absolutely fundamental, which is the question of education. 
And you have to think very much about the educational policy inside of the European Union to see what can you do best to help them to, 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 to accommodate them and their needs when they come to the European Union and to integrate them in a way that is, it's, that this is much better, that this is working better. But this is something that is not working from one day to the other. This is a long process. This is a lot of steps that have to be taken. This is a big, let's say, change in the way of thinking of how to how to make the school education, how to how to accommodate, how to, how to make how to solve the language problem. And there, what Merkel was, uh, it, it, she was doing this remark by a time where there was a big discussion about the giant Turkish let's say group that is living in Berlin and in a lot of German cities and whether it is important for them to, to learn the language and how important it is for them to speak German before getting also the possibility to get German citizenship and everything. And this was in, 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 in a moment when there was, you know, some remarks that would say, no, it's not necessary for, for them to learn German. And the, the Chancellor was saying, yes, you have, if you are here and if you want to live in this country, you also have to learn the language, which is something which is also understandable. Yes, you, there has to be, you know, you have to be an openness from the side of the society, but there has also to be an openness from the people either who come into the country and live and work there, or let's say um, some minorities who have to see how to accommodate the need of the area where they are active. But um, you see, once again, I'm coming back to the European Parliament. When I see now the representation of the European Parliament, thanks God, I see a lot of people and I see a lot of political groups that are very much in working in the field of helping with a better integration of immigrants coming to the European Union. You see now statistics where they show what would be the capacity of the European Union still to accept more immigrants to come. And it will be needed because they will come. And we have to find a solution for that. They should take it much more on their agenda and talk about this agenda much more often. Unfortunately, they take it very often on the agenda, then suddenly something happens in Syria or in another country and it's once again taken off of the agenda. But it is a very burning issue and European politicians are very much aware of this because what they don't want to have is any kind of more social unrest which was produced by, by, by unfortunately, this fact is in the past. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm and optimism about the expansion of the European Union, but I wonder what you think about Germany's recalcitrance of, about the economic weakness of Greece and Spain and Italy. The countries that you named with possible membership in the European Union have even weaker economies. And so how will, this, how will the economic question be solved given Germany's major role in the direction of the European Union? Uh, Germany's major role on the direction of the European Union, I would argue this a little bit. Of course, Germany is, very, is playing a very important role, but thanks to the Lisbon Agreement, there are also now other powers that have a very um, decisive role in the European Union. And sometimes we get the image that always what Germany is saying, it's also automatically happening. I must say Germany is playing a very important role, but there are now a lot of other countries that also are influencing what is happening. But you are very right saying, what, what are we going to do with the um, economic development? And we have already today talked very intensively about the problem of Spain, which is a very big country where there is 25% jobless people, where um, youth unemployment is uh, now about 56% and where there are big trouble. Of course, this is for the moment. Um, let's say, creating huge trouble inside the European Union to get countries like um, Portugal, like Greece, like Spain, or in former time, like um, Ireland, under control. But you know, the interesting thing for me is to see that several years ago, Ireland was the issue, the main issue. Everybody was talking about Ireland and the trouble in Ireland and what is going, what, what is happening there, and the banks were in crisis in Ireland. The problems there, I think Scott going now, uh, finding now their solution. What is happening in Greece? In several months ago, there was the big discussion: Greece has to leave the eurozone. If Greece remains in the eurozone, it is going to create a lot of lot of trouble. What is going to happen there? Is European economic system survive? What is happening in Greece today? Nobody is even discussing about Greece leaving um, the Eurozone because they have implemented so many, um, let's say, 
restrictions and changes in, in Greece that Greece will have a possibility to remain and also to get its economical policy under control. If we're talking about the countries, I was mentioning before about enlargement. You know, you don't need always to see them as kind of an economical liability for the European Union. You also have to see them as a big opportunity for the European Union. And also when Germany is always, um, you know, when, when, when you see that Germany is paying so much money, Germany is also getting a lot of money back from the European Union because they trade with the countries and this is also for them a very important source of income. I think it is of course for the European Union very interesting to open up new markets, to have new investment possibilities in countries like Ukraine that are extremely rich, to get in a closer contact with Turkey, a country which in all the different economical crises is performing economically very well, where you have the substantial growth of the economy um, regularly. So these are also countries that could give a very positive input as possibilities for Europe to invest in these countries and um, by this to profit themselves from, from, from this kind of further enlargements. So, of course, this economic crisis is, is still going on and they will have to, to, to find um, a solution for the biggest problem for the moment is positively Spain. Spain is, is, is really um, uh, in, in very big troubles. But there is still something what you also shouldn't forget. In Spain, thanks God, there are still some very big reserves because Spain went also economically to a very prosperous period of time. And there are still a lot of reserves and a lot of Spanish companies, families, have still some substantial um, financial reserves in the country. And if they are going to solve their macroeconomic problems, what they are trying, what the actual government is trying desperately to solve, and you now see that all these very drastic measures, they have been criticized, of course, in the country by um, the unions and a lot of demonstrations have been there to really change the structure of their administration in a way that they can repair the macroeconomical factors in Spain. I think this will have a very good impact also on the microeconomy and the possibilities for small and medium size enterprises to develop in a better way. And this is going to help also to bring down this unfortunately absolutely horrendous joblessness that is for the moment existing in Spain. So I, on one side, I, I, I don't see that there is a big danger when you negotiate with other countries. I'm sorry for repeating something else. Before a country can join the European Union, it has to go through very substantial changes. It has to adopt a lot of uh, agreements, treaties that, um, that were done to, 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 let's say, prepare the countries very well before they join the European Union. So it is not so easy for a country to join the European Union. And it will take a very long time until countries are able to join. And it is a very tough job for the Serbians, for example, by the mo at, at this moment, to, to implement in Serbia all the requirements the European Union is putting forward for a country to join the European Union. So there has to be very big structural changes in, this, in these countries. They also have to happen in Turkey they, before they come closer to the European Union. And they have to happen in all these countries I was mentioning before, before a country is able to join, uh, let's say, this group of the European Union. So this is also a, a good possibility to see how to make this entry let's say, the most profitable for both sides, for the countries that are joining, but also for the European Union. Thank you very much. Yes. So we can all agree that Germany has a has one of the strongest economies within the European Union. Do you believe that that can be accredited to the fact that they had to reconstruct their economy after World War II? And if so, do you believe there's anything that we could have learned from that that can be applied to any of the other countries within the European Union to strengthen it as a whole? You know, Germany has been always a very innovative country. Germany is, 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 is a very big leader in innovation and they also developed a very active trade inside of the European Union. They have a lot of, lot of partners they are working very closely with inside uh, the European Union. They um, worked very hard to build this up and they also 
beside coping with, let's say, former Eastern Germany, joining them and now becoming really kind of a powerhouse in Germany because they, they brought there the newest technology and, and the newest company and this is also helping them a lot. But of course, they have also given a lot of incentives to other countries. And let me give you here an, as an example Hungary. You know, Hungary for us, our biggest trading partner is Germany. And this is due to the fact that um, in Germany, as you know, is very strong in the car industry. So now in Hungary has become a country that is very much being a kind of a, um, uh, they are delivering a lot, they, they are producing a lot of parts that you need for the car industry. And by this, they become, we become much stronger because we work with this strong economy from, um, that, that, is, that is in Germany. And by this, let's say it's, it's a, a mutual profit because German companies produce in Hungary, and um, by this is this good. It is good for both countries. Of course, you can learn a lot from the Germans. You can learn a lot of how they are doing and um, and, and and what what they did to bring up the economy. But once again, I I would a little bit contradict that it is always only Germany that is going to dictate what is happening. Germany is playing a very important role. Yes, Germany is today the biggest country in the European Union. Yes. But when you see, really, and this is, this is a problem that, that a lot of people do not look a little bit more behind the mechanisms of the European Union, that if there are several, now the amount of questions where you, the European Union, they decide by consensus, has been limited drastically due to the Lisbon Agreement. And also there are a lot of decisions that are going to be taken with a majority of the votes and where you have to have a majority. And there, if several countries decide together against Germany, Germany can be as strong, as powerful as possible, but the majority or more countries with, more, with a bigger population, they can, they can unite and they can also decide um, uh, against Germany in some political decisions being taken in the European Union because it, 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 it should be avoided that one, let's say, one decisive power suddenly pops up and says, we are, we are going to decide what is happening in the European Union. And this is exactly what is the most important thing. This you see also in the European Parliament. Of course, there are a lot of German members in the European Parliament, but they are only, if you see the whole of the European Parliament, they are only a small group of the whole of the European Parliament. And they um, have also to work with the consensus of all the others to get the majority and to get their decisions through. So, yes, they play an important role. No, they don't play the decisive role. Yes, you can learn from the German economy very much. And, and I hope that, that, that soon others learn their lessons from, from Germany and also try to implement positive developments in their own countries. Thank you very much. Do you believe the current rise of pan-nationalism and racism throughout the EU will prove a problem of future globalization efforts throughout the Europe? And do you believe that the spread of the EU will make people lose their cultural and historical identities? Thank you. So your question is about the rise of nationalistic parties in Europe and whether Europe is using its, its, its cultural identity. First of all, let me start first with the, with the second part. Europe is never going to lose its cultural identity. And this is the fact that you have the European Parliament where all the different cultures, nations, languages, religions are represented in this European Parliament. And they are extremely eager in defending their interests. You see that, for example, in Europe today, there's so much money spent to protect minority languages, to protect um, folk music. There are enormous funds available now today for all the different parts of the European Union to protect, to preserve their folk music, which is a very, very, very specific amount of money that was that was what was now very recently um, giving from the European Parliament. It is so important to protect this diversity because this is something that makes the European Union different and extremely rich. And nobody has any kind of interest to get rid of this and to 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 to, to somehow start with a melting pot. A word that was used sometimes in other countries, but um, to, to make to make out of Europe a melting pot. You know, for a Hungarian, it would be absolutely impossible to imagine to lose the Hungarian language. Hungarian language is spoken by okay now in Hungary by 10 million people around Hungary, probably about 14 million people. If you take the European Union with 280 million people, you say, what, what is this insignificant small language? There are smaller languages like this, but nobody has interest to give up your language. This cultural diversity has to be protected. On the other side, 
concerning the nationalistic parties and let's say the radical parties that are existing in Europe. Unfortunately, we'll find out that in every country in the world, you have a certain percentage of people who have a radical opinion. I, I wouldn't say that whether it's right or left, there is always, unfortunately, a radical party. What is very important, also in the structure of the European Union, is that when you join the European Union, as I mentioned before, you have to have to sign a lot of treaties. You have to give a lot of guarantees what is happening in your country, how your country is going to move forward, what are you allowed to do, what are the freedoms that are guaranteed by the European Union, what can you do and what you can't do. And this is something you sign when you enter the European Union. So also, if once a party is coming up and is getting stronger, that tries to promote some completely ununderstandable, like this Golden Dawn party in, 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 in Greece, they come with completely lunatic ideas, where unfortunately they find in an economical crisis some support by people who are desperate. This is also happening in a lot of societies. They will never play a significant role for their country, because when you are in the European Union, your country can move you know, a little bit like this or a little bit like that. You will never be able, when you come into power in a European Union country, to move in this direction and go away for what, uh, what you have done before and the political structures that you have built up in the past and the political norms you have to fulfill to being a European Union member country. Therefore, the European Union is also a guarantee that these radical parties won't have the possibility to influence the country in a way that this is really getting out of out of control or moving into a direction into a direction where it is um, where it is not acceptable. And this is also one of the big big advantages we have. But once again, of course, it is not pleasant to have these parties. But you can find these parties in a lot of European countries, but in a small percentage, and they will exist. You have to treat with them. You have to try to 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 argue with them. You have to try to convince them, and more important, you have to try to convince the followers of the party that they understand that what the party is wanting from them is something which is completely unrealistic. This is a lot of work, but you have to do it. But no danger that they come into power because European Union has its mechanism to prevent and to protect the countries from that. Thank you. Um, his Excellency. Tibor Noik has indicated to me that uh, our time is draw drawing to a close and um, fearing to invoke his wrath, I think it's probably a good idea for us to draw this discussion to we'll a close. In a Hungarian crisis here. <laughs> so uh, uh, I would like very much to uh, thank His Royal Highness for coming to Texas Tech University and giving this excellent a performance to us and also I understand that His Excellency had acknowledged all the sponsors who made this visit possible but I would like to reiterate my own personal thanks for their generosity and first and foremost to the Office of International Affairs that play an outstanding role in the organization of the internationalization of this university. So thank you very much. I'm gonna do one, add one thing. This morning we're driving, to everybody hear me? This morning we're driving to the radio station to talk to Jim Douglas. We're chatting away in Hungarian. And I turn to his Royal Highness, I say, oh, so is Hungarian your first or second language? And he looks at me seriously and says, it's my sixth. <laughs> so we have had a truly, truly phenomenal guest tonight. Thank you very much, Royal Highness. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you.